I can't believe there's gluten in that. That's the topic of today's show. If you're curious about the gluten-free diet, a little lost, a little overwhelmed, this is one you're not gonna wanna miss. We're gonna talk about those tricky ways they can slip gluten into your food and into your products. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Hey, welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Today we're gonna be talking about what gluten is in and what gluten is not in. In other words, what is safe, what is taboo, and what are some things that you wanna be very, very cautionary about. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic. Now this is a simple list here. In this red zone, you've got things that you definitely want to avoid. So we've got the top of the list, this is grains. Um, and so classically, there's this acronym that's sometimes used Brow, if you will, that's barley, rye, oats, and wheat. So it's an easy way to remember, if you're new to the gluten-free diet, an easy way to remember the classic grains that contain gluten that are definitely taboo if you're trying to follow a gluten-free diet. So, but we're gonna go a little deeper even than that because there are other grains, for example, corn, rice, sorghum, millet, these grains all contain forms of gluten, although classically considered to be safe. In my clinical experience, people going gluten-free, trying to eat these types of grains instead as substitutes, tend to do very, very poorly. I mean, they don't recover their gastrointestinal inflammation, they don't fully recover from gluten-induced damage. So I would caution you, not just on the brow grains, but I would also caution you on corn, rice, sorghum, millet, and teff, and some of the others as well. We'll put a list up for you. Now, in addition, there are pseudo-grains. And pseudo-grains, classically, you have amaranth, you have quinoa, and you have buckwheat. Now, there's a problem with these pseudo grains, and again, these are commonly used as substitutes in the gluten-free world for baking and for cereal-based products. There are some research studies done on quinoa, this was a number of years ago, that found that quinoa proteins actually mimic and create or uh, mimic classic gluten like the gluten found in wheat, but also create inflammation. So they cause that inflammation within the GI tract. A lot of people, in my experience, again, do very, very poorly if they're trying to use quinoa as a substitute. And then we have amaranth and buckwheat. Now the problem with amaranth and buckwheat is that these two grain, pseudo grain cereals, are actually very frequently cross-contaminated, meaning that they will be problematic because they have contamination from other grains like barley, rye, oats, or wheat. So that cross-contamination, I think the last study I read on this showed that cross-contamination was present in up to 40% of products that you could buy in the grocery store and those products were labeled gluten-free. So I want you to be very, very careful around any of these pseudo cereals or pseudo grains as well. So not just grains, but also pseudo grains. Now we also have highly processed foods. Now for several reasons. One of the reasons why is highly processed foods oftentimes have filler ingredients that are grain-based, right? Like wheat, for example, is a common filler in a number of highly processed foods. You get a lot of corn as a filler. You get a lot of rice as filler in these types of products. So I'd caution you to be very, very careful. But even beyond the fillers that can contain grain, there's some researchers now that are looking at food additives 
and other chemicals that are found in food. And a lot of your processed foods contain glyphosate. We know that one of the accelerators to gluten sensitivity, one of the things that ramps up or makes it worse is the pesticide glyphosate, which is commonly found in ultra processed foods. We also know that a lot of the additives For example, MSG is a very, very common food additive, G generally contains gluten in it, and you have to be careful for, for that because that's not super obvious. Now, I'm gonna load up um, some information here for you to check out. So if you look at this diagram here, Again, extreme caution in these different terms. You'll see a lot of these different terms, artificial colors, flavors, and I'll put a link to this. I'll give you this list, so if you're interested and you're really wanting to do the deep dive, just look in the comment section below or in the description of the video below, and I'll make sure that you have access to this list. But these are all different ways that we can find hidden gluten in processed foods. So MSG being an example, but there are a number of other examples as well. Natural flavors, natural colors, non-dairy creamers, pre-gelatinized starch, smoke flavor, textured vegetable proteins, vegetable gum, or just again, this is a list of examples of foods that don't come right out and say gluten, but these terms can mean hidden gluten and you wanna be cautious if you are buying those processed foods and eating them and trying to make them a staple food in your diet. Okay, and then we have beer, malted beverages, uh, and other grain-based spirits. So again, beer, very obvious. Most beers are derived from some type of grain like wheat. Uh, malted beverages, for those of you who aren't aware, malt is another one of those tricks. We actually see this with chocolate too, but malt, is derived from barley and so you want to be aware of that it's a sweetener it's a sugar derived from the grain barley and so you'll sometimes see malted beverages um, a typical malted beverage would be like wine coolers um, or even some of these newer drinks that are coming out now that uh, like ciders some of them have malt as a sweetener in them so you have to watch out for those if you're talking about alcoholic beverages and then malts uh, on the same note malt is very commonly found as well in chocolate so you've got to be real careful um, when you're looking at chocolate because you know think about it chocolate technically is gluten-free but it's what they put in it that isn't the cocoa bean that can get you into trouble so again going back to here anytime you're buying a processed food it's very critical to read the label look at the food ingredient list and compare it again I put the link down below this video compare it to the the terms on that list and generally speaking if you don't see those terms you're, you, you know you're gonna be safe uh, in avoiding that. Now, there's also grain-based spirits. So, you know, again, examples here would be things like whiskey, vodka. Now, I've got an entire gluten-free alcohol guide for those of you who really wanna do a deeper dive on this topic. We'll go ahead and put that link below as well so you can do a deeper dive on gluten-free alcohol if you need to. But a lot of uh, belief around spirits is that because they're distilled, they actually won't have any of the gluten protein left in them, albeit that is a true statement. I have seen people with gluten sensitivity reacting to grain-based spirits quite aggressively, so I would just caution against them. Now, whiskey generally is derived from wheat. You got things like bourbon generally derived from corn. Vodka can come from wheat. It can come from corn. It can come from potato. It can come from um, grapes as well. Now, potato grapes being grain-free would be okay. So again, it boils back down to what is the spirit being produced from, and do they add any of those flavoring agents because a lot of the the distilled spirits now are different flavors they'll make them in vanilla flavor peach flavor and a lot of these flavors can be derivative of grain meaning they produce those flavoring agents from different grains so you've got to watch out and be careful there and then last on the list of obvious things with gluten in the red zone are baked goods baked goods being things like you know cakes pies cookies donuts, 
you know, if you, if you make it with flour, generally speaking, it's classically a, a baked good, pretty obvious to avoid those types of things, but you have to watch out for a lot of the baked goods that are being sold in the store and they're being labeled as gluten-free because many of them, again, they'll have the big, the big two that are used in a lot of these substitute products are corn and rice. And again, corn has a gluten called zane. Rice has a gluten in it called orizinin. And th those two uh, do, there are research studies that show that many people with gluten issues continue to react when they're consuming corn and rice. So you've got to be real careful there. And if you're following no grain, no pain, you know, my advice is to keep the rice and the corn out. Now let's talk about some of the things in the yellow zone. Now, these are things that could have gluten in them, but don't necessarily have gluten in them. And so, um, and some of these don't have gluten in them, but people still react to them anyway. And, and, and so let's talk a little bit about that. So let's look at dairy. This is a question I get all the time is, is dairy gluten free? And the answer is, if we're talking about, you know, cow, or goat or sheep, the answer is nobody's really studied these aggressively to say, yes, 100% sure there's no gluten in dairy. Here's why I say that. We come down here to this bodily fluids here. One of the bodily fluids is breast milk and breastfeeding mothers. And what we do know, we have studied this in humans. So in humans, we do know that there is gluten in breast milk if mom eats gluten. So if mom is eating gluten and the baby's gluten sensitive and the mom is feeding the baby, we know gluten is gonna be showing up in that breast milk, potentially creating some problems. Now, I've seen cases where kids had colic or excessive gas and bloating uh, and other, um, other irritations, right? Chronic diarrhea, things of that nature where mom was eating the gluten and the baby was reacting to the gluten from the breast milk. Now, I'm not saying don't breastfeed your baby, but what I am saying is it's always best to know whether or not you need to be gluten free. Now, because we know there can be gluten passing into breast milk, we have to, you know, we have to ask this question with these other types of common human dairy. So we don't know. My advice is Generally speaking, the first six months of a gluten-free diet, I always encourage people to go dairy-free as well for several reasons. One, we're not 100% sure whether or not there's gluten in these. Nobody's really adequately studied this, in my opinion. Number two, um, there is a protein in these dairies called casein. Now, this is true that casein cross-reacts with gluten. What does that mean? That means that your immune system can confuse casein for gluten and react to it even though technically it's not gluten. And this is very, very common in gluten-free newbies. So this is why with dairy, again, avoid it for at least six months. If you want to try to reintroduce it back into your diet after that point, you can give it a go, although just my experience speaking here, most people that try to make that reintroduction do poorly with it unless they're adding in a special type of dairy called A2 dairy. A2 dairy has a different type of casein. So the casein in A2 dairy is, is different and it's not quite as inflammatory as A1 dairy, which is what most dairy products in uh, the world are made from. And it has to do with the genetics of the cow uh, or of the animal. So again, dairy, cautious, be cautious. That's why it's here in the yellow zone. Now, eggs is another one that we get a lot of question about. If the chicken, if the chicken eats grain, will the eggs contain the grain? And the simple answer is no, it won't. The chicken will not pass gluten from its diet into the yolk or the white of the egg. And this, is, this has actually been looked at. Now, that being said, there are anecdotes, and I hear a lot of them, many, probably from many of you, have, have reported that when you eat from 
chickens that are grain fed, when you eat those types of eggs, you don't feel as well or you don't do as well. Um, there could be numerous other reasons why that's the case. Um, one of them has to do with uh, when you're buying eggs in the grocery store and you're, let's say you're, you're buying regular eggs and you're not buying organic eggs. So one of the things that you may be getting exposure to in those eggs is glyphosate. Now glyphosate being the chemical that's sprayed on grains very commonly twice before they're harvested. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you've got chickens, if, if the chicken farmer is feeding his chickens genetically modified grains that have been sprayed with glyphosate, that's going to find its way into that animal but also into that animal's eggs and that may be one of the reasons why you're reacting but there's technically te again technically there is no gluten in eggs but albeit many people trying to go on the gluten-free diet originally feel like they're reacting to eggs so just again that's why this is on the yellow zone the precautionary zone and the other thing we have here is condiments condiments commonly contain additives fillers or other ingredients that are grain based. You know, perfect example here is soy sauce. You know, if you ever use soy sauce in your cooking, most soy sauces, which is the irony here is the number one ingredient in most soy sauce is wheat. And so a lot of people don't even think think that, right? They don't even they don't even realize it. And again, this goes back to why is it so important to look at labels? because if you're not reading the ingredient list, you can really, really get hammered or glutened, so to speak. Now, other condiments can contain gluten as well. I've seen, I've seen mustards and mayonnaises um, and, and other types of sauce contain fillers like MSG, corn syrup, and other grain-based things that we would wanna try to avoid. So read your labels carefully and avoid them appropriately. Now, also we've got soaps and shampoos on this list. Now there's an argument with soap and shampoo, and that argument is that if gluten is in the soap or the shampoo or the, or the lotion or the cosmetic, can it actually pass through the skin? And the geeky scientific answer that most will give you is no, it can't because the gluten protein supposedly is too large to penetrate through the skin. Now, the answer I'm gonna give you is yes, it absolutely can, and especially this is true if you have an inflammatory skin disease. So if you are struggling with an inflammatory skin problem, something like um, eczema or psori psoriasis, these types of conditions you know, you, we've all heard of leaky gut, or if you've watched me for any length of time, you have, right? Leaky skin is a thing as well. Remember, your skin's an epithelial barrier. Think of your gut as skin that folded inside when you were developing. So it folded into a tube that, that created your GI tract. Your skin is actually, your gut is an extension of your skin. You can have leaky skin as well. And so, you know, maybe when skin is super healthy and strong and you don't have any cuts or scrapes or lesions or inflammation, but when you've got damaged skin and you're using, for example, one of the common ingredients in this is oatmeal. Oat, uh, avenin, to be specific, if you see that term avenin, that's, that's oatmeal, that's oats. And so um, these products, you know, can be problems. I see this all the time, and especially in young kids where parents are using uh, like an oatmeal type of lotion and the child is gluten sensitive and they already have eczema and they're trying to use this oatmeal lotion to fix the eczema and they're actually exacerbating it and making it worse. So I would say that, you know, if your skin is super healthy, no cuts, no scrapes, we could argue uh, scientifically that gluten might be too small to penetrate through the skin, although I would still argue yes in this way. There are numerous, uh, there are numerous things when we apply, remember your skin, it's not just a matter of whether the protein is too big to go through physically because your skin is an organ that breathes, right? So your skin, just like your GI tract, absorbs what you put on it. And to me, uh, common sense goes a long way to say if, if the skin inside of your GI tract becomes inflamed as a result of exposing it to gluten, 
then the skin on the outside of your GI tract very possibly could also absorb that very same gluten and create a problem. So I would say read your labels very carefully and avoid soaps and shampoos that have any of those hidden terms. Again, that article just below where you can find out all those different terms and names that sometimes get put into products that don't obviously say gluten. Then we have instant teas and instant coffees. Now tea and coffee by themselves are gluten free, but what happens a lot of times is, and I, I mentioned malt earlier, malt can be found in some of these instant blends and then you also can get uh, very commonly wheat and wheat starch is sometimes added. So if you've, this is especially true of coffees, more so than teas. Uh, if you've got you know, loose leaf tea, you have nothing to worry about. If you're just grinding your own coffee bean, you don't have anything to worry about. But it's the instants, the ones that are crystallized or powdered and you stir the hot water in and you stir it up and it dissolves, a lot of those will contain grains. So just read your label, be very careful about that. Is chocolate gluten free? Uh, question comes in a lot. You notice um, it, we put it in the yellow zone, meaning you have to be careful. It's not 100% that it does contain gluten, but it's also not 100% that it doesn't. The biggest ingredient that gets put into chocolate is wheat. This is very, very common. They'll dust chocolates with wheat. Sometimes they add wheat to the actual chocolate itself. It also contains malt. Of course, malt is a derivative of barley and is something that you definitely want to avoid. So when it comes to chocolate being gluten-free or gluten-full, you've always got to read the ingredient to make sure that the chocolate you're buying doesn't contain any fillers that are gluten-based. Another really big one is your vitamin supplements. Uh, huge, huge contamination. First of all, there's a major cross-contamination issue because a lot of the manufacturers that make vitamins they will use, they, they don't just produce vitamins, so they will produce other things in their factories, and so they're producing and grinding grains like wheat, barley, rye, etc. cetera, and, um, and sometimes those end up in terms of cross-contamination, so there's a potential for cross-contamination as an issue. Now, the other thing they have to worry about is sometimes it's not cross-contamination at all. Sometimes it's the fillers that are being put into these products. You see a lot of wheat-based fillers. Uh, oftentimes one of the big ones that you'll see, and even though rice is labeled gluten-free, you'll see rice powder as a filling agent. And there's several reasons why you'd want to avoid rice. Number one, rice has been shown in a number of studies to, for people with inflammatory bowel problems to pers cause persistent inflammatory bowel. So we don't want to take a supplement where we're trying to benefit our health where we're getting this rice gluten called orzin in and it's causing a persistent inflammation in the GI tract. But two, rice is oftentimes contaminated with lead, cadmium, and arsenic. You know, very toxic metals. And, and so if your product has that as a feature, again, you're trying to help yourself with a nutritional supplement but you end up accidentally or incidentally hurting yourself uh, even beyond the rice or the gluten-based fillers, but through the heavy metals. And then the last thing on this list is cosmetics. Uh, this is another big area where you're gonna see a lot of grain-based items going into cosmetics. Now there are, and you know, where we have to be careful. So many, I was saying earlier that, you know, soaps and shampoos, as some would argue that they can't absorb through the skin, with cosmetics, look, you're putting this stuff on your eyes and you're rubbing your face. And so your eyes, you have, a, you have a fluid that surrounds your eye and you're rubbing that stuff, potentially getting it into that fluid. You also put cosmetics on your lips. And so you lick your lips and then that goes straight in, that goes into your oral, uh, into your oral cavity. And now, again, there's an absorption issue. So lipsticks would be another example, very much of cosmetics that could be poisonous to you. Chapsticks, lipsticks, etc. So you've got to read your ingredients and make sure, again, that they don't contain any grain-based items. Okay, let's move into the green zone. What is safe? What can we have? One of the top questions that I get asked is wild rice gluten-free? Because we always talk about rice and why we should avoid rice because of the orzenin and the inflammation, but is wild rice gluten-free? 
It's on the green list, right? It is absolutely, yes, it is gluten free. Wild rice is not a grain, it is a grass, it is gluten free. Now, many people react to wild rice for completely different reasons beyond the gluten. Some people are allergic to it. I just happen to be one of those individuals, so I don't eat it, but that doesn't mean you can't try it. Wild rice is a safe gluten free food. What you have to be careful with is when they take wild rice and then they mix in other rice that isn't wild rice. So they mix in, you know, other long grain rices, right? So that's where you have to be careful. So you do have to read the ingredients to make sure that you're not getting exposure to those other ingredients, but just pure organic wild rice, perfectly fine. What else can we consume? on a gluten-free diet that's super easy. Okay, the green zone is any animal meat that your heart desires, right? So fish, which is an animal meat as well here, right? So we got fish, we got chicken, we got beef, we got bison, we got elk, we got deer, um, you name it. Wild game to your heart's content. Now I'm gonna put this link up for you as well that you can tap into so this is just a, a comprehensive article on everything that you can have that's gluten free so that you don't feel quite so overwhelmed by what you can't have some people get caught up in the whole I can't have the things I like, and then they forget about all the other wonderful potential options that are part of, or could be part of their diet. So this article here, feel free, I'm gonna put the link down below, but you know, the different nuts and fruits and vegetables and different meats, all available for your palate. Um, and if you wanna too, if you wanna go to Gluten Free Society, you can check out our recipe page and we'll blow that up for you. And we've got lots of different recipes for breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, etc. So you can find it, you know, by your allergy even, you can do a search, but take advantage of those resources. Again, I'll put a link up to that as well below for you. So um, bottom line, there's a lot of great foods that you can consume, meat, fish, fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, spices, herbs, alcohol again in moderation, um, especially if you're still sick and you're trying to overcome years of gluten-induced damage, I, I would actually encourage you to avoid alcohol uh, for, you know, for the, maybe the first half year or longer as you're trying to, to heal and then eggs. Uh, but you know, the delineation with some of these, so, so let's talk about a few delineations in, in quality, right? Because one of the issues that people run into when they're buying their food is beyond gluten. So we're going to go beyond gluten. So, okay, an important note is most people that seek a gluten-free diet are not going gluten-free because they are glutton for punishment um, of restriction, right? Why are they going gluten-free? They're going gluten-free because they're sick and they're trying to change their diet so they can recapture, regain their health, right? So the whole premise, this cardinal rule of nutrition, number one, you cannot get healthy eating food that is not healthy. Number two, you cannot maintain your health eating food that is not healthy. So when we're talking about these different items here, what obviously is going to be your best choice when you're looking at things like wild rice, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, spices, and herbs, even alcohol, right? What, what really should you be looking for? Well, number one, organic. Now, organic isn't perfect. We don't have the, per there's no such thing as a perfect system, but organic is, is much, much better than conventional for many reasons. The biggest reason being that pesticides can damage your microbiome, okay? That's part of, part of the problem. Remember, one of the problems are the accelerants to, you know, some people say, I've been eating gluten my whole life and now all of a sudden I can't eat it anymore. Well, why did that happen? For a lot of people, the reason that happened, maybe it was an antibiotic, maybe it was an accumulation of years of pesticide exposure by consuming you know, conventional-based foods, 
um, you know, there's generally there there are things that accelerate that process and can can aggravate it. So when we're when we're trying to heal from again from that damage, we want to look for organic. Now, ideally. You know, a lot of people will say, well, organic is really expensive. I can't afford it. I can't get it in my budget. Look, at it. I can't tell you how to prioritize your money. What I, what I can just simply say is organic is a healthier choice. And if you're trying to restore your health, you may have to look at making some sacrifices in other aspects of your life to do that. There are other cheaper options and one of them is to join a co-op so you know instead of going maybe like the Whole Foods or the organic section of the local grocery store you can look up different co-ops the co-ops are basically local community farms where the food is being grown by a community organization and the food is being grown organically and to join a co-op is much less expensive than to go and hand pick everything in the grocery store organically so this is an option for many of you who are trying to navigate you know the budget around you know going organic um, so a co-op is a good thing to join and the, the, the downfall, I shouldn't say the downfall, but some of the, 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 the fallback for a, for a co-op is that if you're in a co-op, what you're going to get is what's in season. You're, you know, so you know, if, if it's December, you're not going to have blueberries from your co-op. Um, because, it, I mean, unless you live in a region of the world where December is blueberry month, right? But like down here in Texas where I'm at, you know, blueberries come in in June. Uh, they come in in May. May, a little bit at the end of April even um, but but another you know again depending on where you're at what is seasonally available and what grows where you live co-ops generally are gonna have only what's in season and what's local to the region so you may have some limitations on some things meaning you may you may want to expand your palate and try some new things out but a co-op is definitely a great more budget conscious way to ensure that you're getting healthier organic options so that you're not being exposed to all the chemical pesticides and sprays that could also act as inflammatory agents on your GI tract as you're trying to heal it. Um, so very, very important in that regard. Now I also recommend with, with alcohol, I recommend or, organic as well uh, or, or just don't drink it at all because alcohol, first of all, alcohol is a poison. It's not good for you. I mean, it, you, you may find that it's helpful for relaxation or you may find that it's great in social situations to help you relax or whatnot. But at the end of the day, alcohol is a poison. Um, you're better off not drinking it if you're trying to be healthy than you are drinking it. But if you are going to drink it, again, I would encourage you to look for organic versions of it. When it comes to animals, um, when it comes to meat, what we're looking for is either wild game. So if you're a hunter or you know hunters, you know, um, that's a good thing. Maybe you can, maybe you can connect and get some wild uh, game in that way. But, you know, if we're talking about beef or chicken, as an example, we're looking for the term free range and ideally also organic. And then with beef, we're also looking for grass fed slash grass finished um, important why um, because the health of the animal is dependent upon the health of the diet just like you your health is dependent on how healthy your diet is and if you're eating a bunch of food that isn't good for you you're not going to be very healthy well you know in traditional conventional farming what do they do they take these animals and what do they do they pump them full of genetically modified grain uh, they pump them full of a bunch of chemicals and simultaneously um, you know, cows are not designed to eat grain as a staple food. Neither are chickens, uh, neither are any other um, livestock type animal. Grain is not their staple food. Generally, they're foragers, they, they graze. You know, chickens eat bugs and worms, they eat grass. Um, but as a general rule, these are the guidelines you want to try to live by the best that you can. And again, you're going to pay more money for this. but. I always like to look at it this way, you know, you can pay your money for your food or you can pay your money more of it. Number one cause of bankruptcy in the US is medical bills. You can pay it to the doctor. More specifically, you're paying a lot less to the doctor than you are going to pay to pharma or the hospital. So you have a choice. You know, you can spend it one way or the other. Um, my advice would be to prioritize your spending and prioritize your health by picking things that are healthy so that you can recover. Um, 
and you can have a quality of life like no other. So, if we summarize, you've got the red zone, grains, pseudo-grains, highly processed foods, beer, malted beverages, and grain-based spirits and baked goods. Cautionary, dairy eggs, bodily fluids. You know, we talked about, uh, we talked about breast milk, but I, I, let me back up because we didn't talk about saliva and I wanted to just briefly mention saliva. So kissing someone who's not gluten-free, ladies and fellas, if your partner isn't gluten-free, you know, you got to be careful because if they just ate a sandwich and, you know, now you're, you're kissing and swapping fluid, um, there's that potential you're going to get contaminated with gluten. So you got to be careful in that regard. Condiments, soap, shampoos, instant teas and coffees, chocolates, vitamin supplements, cosmetics, very common to be cross either cross contaminated or have fillers so you got to watch out read your labels that's the key read your labels and then the green list again meat fruits vegetables nuts seeds spices herbs eggs uh, wild rice alcohol all part of the go list so there you have it now again below this video I'll put up a few links for you that you can go check out a more comprehensive list download it keep it with you as you're learning how to navigate the diet and how to navigate your health. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful. Don't forget, like, subscribe below for more content like this, for more great videos. It's one of the best ways that you can support our program and it's free to you, it's of no cost to you. Also, don't forget to come visit our sponsor, glutenfreesociety.org. You can check out all of our free guides, how to go gluten-free, um, our alcohol guide, you can check out some of our free video tutorials so that you can better navigate the gluten-free diet with confidence while also improving your health without slipping up. Thanks so much and we'll see you in the next show. Research shows that more than 90% of people embarking on a gluten-free diet continue to have persistent inflammatory problems. And one of the big reasons why is these individuals are reacting to other foods beyond gluten. That's why we at Gluten Free Society developed the lymphocyte response assay. This specialized technology helps to identify what are known as delayed food reactions. Now most people with food allergies, they know they have them. It's an acute or an immediate response, but a delayed response can occur between three hours and three weeks after ingestion. That's what makes it so difficult to do a food diet history and figure out what you could be reacting to. So we developed a platform where you could have these types of reactions tested for. Now, unlike most online food sensitivity tests, which only measure one type of reaction, our LRA technology measures all five types of delayed hypersensitivity responses that you can have to foods. Why is this important? Because many of the other tests are going to give you false or misleading information or an incomplete picture about how you can change your diet. Now we have hand selected 222 of the most common gluten-free foods to incorporate into our testing. It's a simple blood draw, it doesn't require a doctor's note, and the results come back within two to three weeks and with these results you can custom create a diet blueprint to help you on your path to gluten-free wellness. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this and make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.